Welcome to the Mies Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Sharkey, the founder and CEO of Mies, the culinary operating system for food professionals. On the show, I'll be interviewing world-class entrepreneurs in the food space that are shifting the paradigm of how we innovate and operate in our industry. Thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoy the show. Yo. They say art mirrors life with every stroke of the pencil. I'm giving you folks a glimpse into my This is part one of a special live recording with my friend, a chef who needs no introduction, a true pioneer and craftsman in the culinary world, Chef Wiley Dufresne. This was a fireside chat I had the pleasure of hosting at Terrytown Estates, just outside of New York City, for our annual Mies Team Summit. The team flew in from all over the world to connect and set goals for 2023, and Chef Wiley was gracious enough to spend some time with us as we discussed everything from creativity, the process of iteration and innovation, team culture, why American cheese is so delicious, and much, much more. I hope you enjoy. This podcast is brought to you by Mies, the culinary operating system for food professionals. As a chef and restaurant owner for the past 20 years, I was frustrated that the only technology that we had in the kitchen was financial or inventory software. Those are important, but they don't address the actual process of cooking, training, collaboration, and consistent execution. So I decided if it didn't exist, I'd do my best to get it built. So the current and next generation of culinary pros have a digital tool dedicated to their craft. If you're a chef, mixologist, operator, or generally if you manage recipes intended for professional kitchens, Mies is built just for you. Organize, share, prep, and scale your recipes like never before, and get laser-accurate food costs and nutrition analysis faster than you could imagine. Learn more at www.getmies.com. Okay, everybody. I'm really excited. Is everybody else? We have a living legend with us today. I can safely say the culinary world would not be where it is today without the chef sitting right here. He has won James Beard Awards, Michelin stars. His restaurant has been voted one of the best, 50 best in the world. Uh, he's judged on Top Chef and Master Chef. Uh, you might have seen him on shows like Treme and Billions. He is probably the only chef that has his own character on The Simpsons. He's worked for a bunch of incredible chefs, which we'll probably talk about. Opened a restaurant called 71 Clinton on the Lower East Side before there was anything like that on the Lower East Side. Yeah, yeah, we will. I cannot wait for the push-ups that he's going to do. Uh, I wish he was the one that asked that question about why he didn't get hired. Um, after 71 Clinton, he opened a restaurant called WD50, eponymous WD, his initials plus... The location, Finn, five push-ups anyways, please, just for the love of it. All right. Okay, I wasn't joking, but. Um, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, good. All right. So had WD50 for 11 years, groundbreaking restaurant. There was no restaurant like that that existed in America when it, when it opened. And we'll obviously talk a bunch about that and really just inspired every chef in the world. After 11 years of that, he dug deep into the world of donuts, and we could talk about that as well, but I've never seen anybody go as deep and wide on, uh, that didn't sound good, but on donuts. Uh, and now he's doing the same with pizza. We're going to talk today about creativity and innovation and execution and vision and a bunch of other things around that. So Chef Wiley Dufresne, welcome. Thank you very much. Um, it's nice to be here. It's weird to have the low ground. Normally, oh, situations yeah. like this are meant to be, but... It's... I'm used to being below everybody, so, yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm happy to be here. I have been also a long-time friend and fan of Josh's and the things that he, he's been up to, the people that he's worked for and with. I have, I think, hopefully been a long-time supporter of Mies as we have had unusual occasions to interact through the halls at Orify over the years. And so fortunately, I got to see you more than I probably would have during those early days and got to be, you know, a little bit of a fly on the wall in the process. So that was kind of cool to see. And I'm always the guy bugging you about percentages and things like that. But I'm just a cook who's excited to be here and talk about whatever it is, you know, you guys feel like chatting about. So thanks for having me. Yeah. Well, we are very honored, Jeff. So thanks for being here. And I forgot to ask, one of us is on log duty today. I think 
I'm closer, so I'll take it. Because the fire's going to go out soon. Oh, I um, can put a log uh, in the I'll, fire. That's I'll, okay. I'll do. Actually, no, you know what? Finn, I think Finn is, I think Finn is going to be the... Uh, I'll take it after. I have a fireplace, and this is not enough wood for very yeah. long. All right, so after you're done putting logs on the fire, because this is like a real fireside chat, I refuse to have one without an actual fire. Maybe you could just talk to everybody about, uh, I think everybody here knows about you and, and the restaurants you've had, but just a little bit more about your background and how you got to where you are today. I've been working professionally in kitchens since I was 11, following very strict child labor laws in multiple states. My father was, was in the restaurant business. Um, he had a number of restaurants in Providence, Rhode Island, which is where I was born. My parents were and continue to be divorced. And so summers meant time with dad. And I had a somewhat unfortunate incident my one year of summer camp. Quick story, they were opening up everybody's mail at summer camp. They would call you up at dinner and say, Wiley, you have a package, come up, pick up your package. It was open already, they'd give it to you because anyone that's been to summer camp knows they send, mom and dad send, or grandma sends candy. You're not allowed to have candy at summer camp. They would open up your packages and so I said to the counselor, I said, I'm not, I'm not sure you're allowed to do that. Like, we can open the package together, but you can't give me my package opened. And it sort of fell on deaf ears. So as a 11-year-old, I sent a letter to the postmaster <laughs> in the state of Vermont. And at the end of the summer, the head of the camp pulled me aside and said, I'm not sure this is the right place for you. And I said, well, it, it, long story short, I think the postmaster reached out to them. So summer camp was over for me, which meant I could go back to hanging out with dad, which meant I worked in restaurants because dad owned restaurants. And so I was, I was in food service when most people would be going to summer camp. That was my job. So I did all sorts of stuff, food service of all kinds, both front of house, back of house, you know, cleaning lobsters, cleaning toilets, being a, a waiter, being a bus boy, being a crappy cook. And then finally, the summer before my senior year of college, I had a real job in a real restaurant in Rhode Island that I really, I really enjoyed. And that's when it sort of the bug, the bug got me. I think if in a perfect world, if I could have been anything, I would have liked to have been a first baseman for any baseball team that would have me. But unlike Finn, I don't possess any particular speed or... Um, <laughs> strength or I'm sort of the average height of the average American male. I don't have any particular physical attributes that would help me in that particular aspiration. But I came to realize that that summer before my senior year of, of, of college that all the things I loved about team sports were in a kitchen. Everything that I loved that really moved me about team sports were exactly almost identical to a kitchen. It's uncanny when you think about it. You wake up in the morning and you practice. You wake up in the restaurant, you prep. You have role players, you have sous chefs, you have captains, you have coaches, you have managers, you have chefs. There's all these parallels along the way, but, but sort of I think maybe the most important parts of, I played team sports as a kid. I did not play a lot of individual sports. I love team sports. I think there's a lot of life lessons to be had in team sports, but team sports and kitchens, they're highly redemptive. And I think that's an important aspect of both of those things. You miss a layup, you strike out, you drop a ball, but that happened. Let's not get stuck on that. You overcooked a fish, you brought the food to the wrong table. There's any number of parallels, but you're going to do that a hundred more times today. So we can't get stuck on that. Let's take that. Let's use that moment. Let's say, okay, you missed a layup, not the end of the world. You struck out again, not the, you went to the wrong table. That's a big deal. No, I'm sorry. Um, and so I realized, like, everything I loved about this process, it was a group of people with a common goal. You know, we wanted to win. We wanted to have a good service. And I was like, everything that I loved about sports, I was suddenly finding here. And so as soon as, before I started my senior year of college, I knew that I wanted to go into the restaurant business. I knew that that's what I wanted to do. And I was supposed to graduate college and then go spend, take a year with my roommate. And we were going to go skiing in uh, New Mexico for a year or a season. My mom thought better of that and said, I'll, I'll make a deal with you. I'll help you pay for culinary school if you decide not to do that. It was a tough moment between my friend and I. It took a couple of years to, to mend that fence, but I sort of pulled out. I literally had my car packed and, and kind of bowed out and 
went to culinary school because I, I, my intention was to go find somebody to work for. I, was, I, I didn't have the money to go to school. It, it didn't occur to me I was going to go the old-fashioned route. I was going to find somebody I can work for and just ground up. My mom, a wonderful person, she has helped me out. And so I went to culinary school during the day, French Culinary Institute in Manhattan. I went there from 9 to 2 and 2.30 and from 3 to whenever I had to be at the Gotham Bar and Grill. I was working pastry in the pastry kitchen at the Gotham Bar and Grill. So I'd go to school all day, go to work all night, rinse, repeat. And then after that, I worked for Jean George for many years. And then after that, I worked for Jean-Louis Paladin briefly. And then after that, I sort of was, was lucky enough to strike out on my own with some stops in, in France for a bit for a great chef in France. And uh, yeah, and then we went, 71 Clinton happened and then WD happened and then Alder happened uh, briefly and then Donuts happened for a bit. And now we are, we are on to pizza. Well, thank you. That's it in a nutshell. Thanks to the summer camp for kicking me out. <laughs> <laughs> I think if I'm right, full circle with your first like quote unquote real restaurant in Rhode Island, wasn't it Al Forno? Did, did you work at Al Forno? Well, so I don't know those of you that know Al Forno's or not, they use your platform at Al Forno's? Surge? Get them on there. So Al Forno is a two-story restaurant, and it used to be Al Forno on top, and on the bottom it was called Lucky's. And technically I worked at Lucky's, which was on the bottom. Lucky's is now gone, and it's been turned into Al Forno's up and down. But and again, in another sort of ironic twist, I worked the pizza station at Lucky's. Al Forno and Lucky's, they were famous for their grilled pizzas. George and Joanne were... Mm-hmm built their sort of reputation on the idea of taking pizza dough and stretching it over hot coals, grilling it on one side, flipping it over and topping it and grilling pizza. It was an idea that they had come across in Europe and sort of they, they became very well known for that. So yes, my very first job was in Watch Hill peeling potatoes for $5 a bucket. But my first job that like where I got, I got the bug was at Lucky slash El Forno. That is correct. That's cool. I can't think of all the accolades that you've had over your career. And I'm sure we can talk about those for days. But let's um, not. so let's not. Let's talk about maybe the biggest failure that you've ever had and what you learned from it. I mean, failure is a strong word. So I'm going to maybe opt out of. I would say that the, the thing I've struggled with the most is the intersection of art and commerce. I think that the best restaurateurs have done that. And I think that for me, there were certainly times when I, I cared more about the art than the commerce. And again, I think there, there were times when I had, I had blinders on about trying to find that intersection. And I think as I've gotten older and wiser, hopefully, well, that's leather, but that's wood, um, that I'm, I'm getting closer to that intersection, that Venn diagram where those two things exist. I think that I don't know... How many of you saw the very recent announcement by Rene Redzepi of Noma that he's choosing after 20 years to close? And I think if you parse through that and just kind of look at the very big picture of it, I think some of it is probably him not saying this, but maybe he's just exhausted because fine dining is an exhausting process. But as he pointed out, it's expensive. You know, it's expensive. And I think that finding that intersection is challenging it. I don't regret deciding art over commerce, but I think that sometimes I did it to my own detriment, if that makes sense. So I think failure is a tough word because I think that I have benefited from that decision on some levels, but I think in other ways, I wish I had done a better job. I wish I had been more willing. I'm not saying compromising. I don't wish that I had compromised because I don't wish that I had compromised. I wish that I had worked a little bit harder a little bit more thoughtfully at trying to find a sweeter spot for those two. Yeah. And I'm hoping that maybe I'm doing that now with pizza. Yeah. I mean, to sort of pull a tentacle on that, like how do you now think about balancing like the mind of Wiley, what you really, what you truly want to do versus what a customer like expects? I think sometimes that can be challenging because I think a lot of the art that people make is for themselves. And it's not to say, I don't care what you want to eat, but it's also to say, I spent a lot of time thinking about this and I'd really love for you to try it. And, you know, it's fine that you want a salad, but I don't know that I'm the guy to make it for you tonight. There's nothing wrong with salad. 
I'm not sure exactly why you're here if you want salad. But <laughs> so I, I'm trying. I'm really, yeah. I'm really, really trying. And I'm trying not to fuck up pizza by overwiling pizza because because I'm old. <laughs> Not that old, but yeah. well, you know, and sometimes I think about the importance of timing in business. And you were put in a position where you were asked to compromise with WD because that restaurant didn't exist. But then you opened up a window where that type of restaurant becomes ubiquitous, and others aren't asked to, you know, to compromise. And so maybe it's less of a question of should you have compromised more, but did you sort of? suffer so that others didn't have to? That's hard for me to answer. I did not feel like I was suffering. Don't feel bad for me. I enjoyed every minute. I mean, if we're going to specifically focus on WD-50 as the most extreme example, because I think as I've gone from WD-50 to Alder to Donuts to Pizza, I've sort of tried to come in from out in the cold and land a little bit more centric, but I loved it over here. I was happy as a clam. You know what I mean? If going to work in a restaurant of that nature, of that caliber, is like pushing the rock, you know, if we talk about Sisyphus and you push, he pushes the rock up every day and he wakes up in the morning, the rock's at the bottom of the hill. You know, many people will say, what's the classic? I was a philosophy student in college. So there's a classic argument of like, well, what's the point? Well, the point is, imagine if you love pushing that rock up the hill. Imagine if you find an insane amount of joy pushing that rock up the hill, then it's not so bad. And it's not really a rock. There's no hill. It's just... I would tell anybody to do what you like to do. And I mean, that's a great luxury, right? Not everybody has that luxury of doing something that they love to do. So it's easy for me to say, do what you love, because there's a lot more in a person's life that I couldn't possibly understand that would make them decide to do something that they don't do because there's other people who's, you know, children, houses, mortgages. There's reasons why you do things that you have to, that don't always allow you. But if you have the opportunity to do whatever it is, whether you like licking stamps or working at a toll booth or throwing a baseball or working at Mies, uh, whatever you do, I, I would want for you and I would want for the people that come to WD-50 or, or Stretch or Alder or wherever to love what they do. And, you know, I think it's a different paradigm now and there's so many more restaurants than there were when you and I started. And I think you and I come from a world where the only people that were there were the people that loved it. And it's hard sometimes for people to see when there are moments of brutality or moments of, yes, we could all do better. It's yes, restaurants are without question broken in many ways about how they treat people and things like that. But they're also full of people that love every moment of it. And I think that that's not something that's often part of the conversation. And we can always without question do better and there's a thousand moments i wish i could have back but there's ten thousand moments of you know joy and happiness and and like i very much loved the process so you know the fact that i wasn't able to always find you know the intersection of art and commerce and and some of that other stuff but like i for me i, I wasn't going to compromise i wasn't going to do that you know, maybe that's the, maybe I should blame my parents for that, but that wasn't an option really. We we're going to stay the course. Yeah. I think, you know, it, it created sort of a wonderland for us as cooks when you started it. I think speaking of paradigms, you, you created a new paradigm of cooking. In, in my opinion, when you, when you opened WD, I remember when I staged there in 2003, I think you had just, you had just opened just before I started working or after working at Boulay or something. And everything was new. I mean, the techniques were the same, right? You would air a, you did, like we talked about, but everything we saw was new. Everything was so creative and ideas that we just never thought of as, as chefs. And there was this creativity that we had never seen before. And you had an incredible team of technically proficient chefs and cooks. And you yourself are like known as a cook's cook because you are technically you know, incredible at, at cooking. But there was a culture of creativity there that just hadn't existed before. And clearly the cooks that you brought didn't have that innately, you know, fully in them when they, when they came. So I wanted to talk a little bit about creating that culture of creativity. And first off, I, we got a question from someone on the team that I thought was really awesome, which is, can you teach creativity? No, you can't. My mother said this to me once. She said, you can't say, okay, today's Tuesday. I'm going to wake up. I'm going to be creative. You can't plan to be creative but you can plan for creativity. You can hunt for creativity. You can go after creativity. 
I mean, I, I know for a fact that a lot of my curiosity, I think curiosity is part of finding your way to creativity. I think part of being creative is being curious, comes from my parents and they're encouraging me to ask questions. And so that is kind of, that is kind of in a nutshell what I do is I, I, I ask questions a lot. And so you know, we tried to set up a place and it wasn't just, you keep mentioning for the cooks. It wasn't just for the cooks. It was for everybody that worked there and it was for anybody that wanted to dine there. We were creating a place where you could continue your culinary education. Like if everybody was welcome to be part of the process. In fact, again, it's a team sport and I keep going back to that. It's a team sport. Sure. The buck has to stop with somebody, right? And I get that. But Let's be clear, right? No great creative endeavor in the history of the world is a work of one person. There were four Beatles, you know? One guy didn't paint the Sistine Chapel, you know what I mean? It's a bunch of people that contribute to a process, you know? There probably are a few things. I don't know. Stephen King maybe sits up there in his log cabin and writes books all by himself. I don't know. but With alcohol. But... <laughs> But it's a team sport. So what we wanted to do was build a place where we could continue our culinary education, where we could continue to ask questions about everything. You know, so cooking, right, is something that it turns out that we as cooks don't know much about. We just don't know that much about it. We've been cooking really good food for a really long time. So we've learned how to cook, but we don't really know why we do what we do, right? We just don't know what's happening to our food when we cook it. We don't know the answers to those questions. We have not known the answers to those questions really ever. And so when you step back and you say, well, if I want to know the answers to those things, then I can control the process a little bit, right? So what is cooking? You step back, what is cooking? Well, cooking is, is certainly a little bit of physics. It's certainly a little bit of biology, but it's a lot of chemistry. It's chemistry. It's a, a series of chemical goings on over and over and over and over again. But that's not ever part of your training, my training. That's not part of anybody's culinary training. So we realized, I realized early on that you're going to have to go outside your traditional methods of understanding because in order to understand, once you realize that cooking is a science and we're not scientists and not trained as such, you need to go find the people that are. And it turns out that there are lots of people out there that know a lot about food. So that's what we did was we began to establish relationships with those people that can explain things to us. And so my job was to go out there and get that information and bring it in and disseminate it to the team so that they could do things with it. But that's just one aspect of running a restaurant. You know, you've also, you've also got floor staff, you've got customers. And so we wanted to create this place where anybody that wanted to continue their ongoing culinary education would have a place to do that. That to me is what's so great about cooking is that you'll never learn anything there is to learn about cooking. You'll never learn at all. If you're interested in learning, it's an opportunity to learn forever. And no one, I mean, I don't think it, who's going to say, well, okay, we're done learning guys. Like, that's good. We're good. We've got enough. We'll hit the brakes. Learning's over. Let's go back to being dumb. No. So that was what it was. It was create a place where you could continue your culinary education, you, this journey and the staff were, we needed everybody's input to make it special, to make it unique. And then we wanted your buy-in too. We wanted you to come and say, you know what, tonight I feel like going on a journey or Tonight, you know, we're four, I don't know, investment bankers, and we just sacked a city, and we just want some Barolo and steaks. Okay, we'll do that for you too, but if you do want to go on the journey, we'd, we'd love to take you on this fun journey, and, and, you know, it was our job to figure out where you wanted to enter and, and what you want, how deep you wanted to go, but we, that's what we wanted to do, we wanted to build this place where you could go and, and have, have an experience, and where the cooks, the front of staff, everybody that was involved, you know, if the dishwasher said, chef, I have an idea on how we can make this process better, Great. I want to hear it. I want to hear it. It's awesome. The underlying like thread I hear across all that is it's almost not even creating a culture of creativity, but a, but a culture of curiosity. It sounds to me like the birth of a lot of the ideas or the innovation you have starts with a question. Like, why are we doing this? It starts this with a question. It starts with creating a place where people feel comfortable saying, I have an idea or I have a question or, you know, it, that's really important is, is letting everybody know. I'm sure all of you have tons of great ideas. And some of you are better than others at saying, hey, I have an idea. Some people are incredibly anxious about bringing their ideas to the table. So it's about trying to create a place where they feel encouraged, where they don't feel intimidated, where they can come and say, hey, I have an idea. You know, I want to make bagel flavored ice cream. Great. That sounds amazing. Why the fuck didn't I think of that? You know, go get some bagels, you know, 
And then someone else says, hey, I got an idea. If we take the ice cream and we put it in a mold and a tiny little mold that's round, it'll look like a bagel. And then if someone else says, if you buy me that airbrush, chef, I've been asking you for, <laughs> when it pops out, we can airbrush it with some brown and some black and sprinkle some everything bagel seeds on it, and it'll look like a bagel, but it'll be ice cream. And then someone else says, hey, you remember that thing we were doing before? We were taking cream cheese and drying it out. Well, bagels are good with cream cheese. And then someone else says, well, remember that salmon that you had to like stir for 7 million hours in a pot till it looked like fiberglass? Don't put that back on the menu, chef. <laughs> <laughs> and I would say, yeah, I remember that. And they say, well, bagels are great with salmon and cream cheese. And then suddenly now you have a bagel that's normally crunchy, but it's creamy and it's ice cream, but it looks like a bagel. And you've got the cream cheese is normally creamy and it's crunchy. And you've got this weird salmon and who knows what the hell it is. And like six different people took an idea and marched it down a road and everybody feels better because everybody like that idea is made better by a group, you know, the same way. I think when you're in a hospital and like the doctors go on rounds, don't you want them all to agree on the best way to heal you? Like if they're all like, I have no idea what to do with that guy. You're like, Oh shit, that guy's screwed. But if everyone's like, you know, more vitamin C, then he's going to be fine, you know? And it's creating this environment where everybody feels like, hey, I got an idea. And, and that's not that hard. It's actually not that hard. You just have to like really make everybody feel like they're allowed to say something. Was there any sort of filter to those ideas or like any boundaries you put around them when someone came? Well, again, I had to be the ultimate arbiter. Or there were a couple of us that were the ultimate arbiter. And, you know, not every idea is a good idea or not every idea is complete. You know, you can take that idea and you can see someone who's more experienced in the process can see, and I don't have an example, I'm sorry, but can say like, you're onto something, but if we turn the dial a couple of clicks this way, then that might be how we can move it. And that person still feels like they were part of it. Yeah. You know what I mean? But it would be like, I would go and get an ingredient, right? I'd go and get sake leaves. I don't know if you guys know what sake leaves is, but when they make sake, which is obviously wine made from rice, they press it, and when they're done, it's just this mush of delicious, fermented, weird stuff that in 2004, nobody was using. But our sake guys had tons of it, and I was like, this stuff looks great. What do we do with it? So I gave a bag of it to Mario Carbone, and Mario said, can we make pasta out of it, chef? Sure, why not? Go figure it out. And so he went, and he, Mario Carbone of Carbone, of, you know, we're all going to work for Mario at some point, right? Because they have a rather growing empire, and Mario came back and he said, I've made this pasta and it was delicious. And then we built basically linguine and clams out of sake lees flavored pasta and, and clams cooked in sake. And then we took kimchi that we were buying at the green market. And, you know, cause you put chili flakes in linguine and clams and we took kimchi and we spread them out and dehydrated it and covered the whole bowl of pasta and these sheets of kimchi and you broke it up and, and like a dish was born. And, you know, I think that was the first dish Mario ever created on his own, you know, yeah. and, and it makes people feel good. We had to help that dish find its way, but it started with me saying to Mario, what can you do with this? Here's an ingredient. What can you do with it? That's cool. Do you ever find that you have to kill an idea? And if so, how does that happen? <sighs> um, I mean, you have to kill an idea when it's not delicious. I mean, I was stubborn. I was real stubborn about things, you know, like if someone said, I don't like that dish, I was like, then it's going on the menu, you know, <laughs> but that's not always the best approach. You know, you don't always have to poke the bear, you know, or you kill an idea and people go, why did you take that off the menu? You know, the uh, eggs Benedict was a dish that we had on the menu that was every component of eggs Benedict sort of inverted and turned on itself with the, the crux of it being deep fried hollandaise the dish was built around the fact that we figured out how to deep fry hollandaise side note sergio i ate that dish with you for the first time <laughs> with graham elliott boyle was there <laughs> yeah and there's a long story about it please in the, if all of you can buy the book you'd be the the only the only 25 people that bought it that would be great um <laughs> the story behind it but we built the dish around that and we made it for a really long time and i i just got tired of making it i got tired of it Felt like every night someone wanted me to play the song remains the same. I was like, I just don't want to play that song anymore. We took it off the menu and people freaked out. And it was more like, because I'm okay disappointing you, like I, which is probably a mistake. 
or a defect that I have that I'm okay doing that. But it was more like someone, people would come up to me and say, you know, I came all the way from Australia and I really wanted to try that. And that worked. So I put it back on the menu. So I killed the idea and it was a bad idea. So I killed one of my children and I brought it back to life. You can only do that in the kitchen, I guess. <laughs> so, I mean, obviously you change the menu often. So uh, we got a lot of questions from the team about, I mean, we're obviously, you know, in a technology company, we're constantly iterating and tweaking and love to sort of dig into what your process of iteration and when does something feel done that it goes on the menu and how much iteration happens before that? I mean, sometimes a blind squirrel finds a nut and you get lucky and that process doesn't take long. Like we sometimes will have ideas that come together quickly and then sometimes we'll have ideas like figuring out how to deep fry hollandaise took a really long time. It probably took three months, three and a half months to figure that out. And foolishly, while we were working on how to do it, we weren't thinking about what we would do with it once we figured it out, <laughs> which was a lesson learned. Like, Because I just got fixated on the idea. I don't want to bore you, but previous to frying hollandaise, we had fried mayonnaise. And we built a dish around frying mayonnaise. It was basically just a sandwich. It was like a BLT with mayo. And then we put that frying of mayonnaise to bed for a bit. And then a couple of years later, because that's sometimes what has to happen, right? You're like, okay, that's, we've done that. And they took the dish off the menu and, and we had fun with it. But again, Mies is born out of the kitchen notebook idea, if I'm not mistaken, right? And so I too have an endless, ridiculous number of shoeboxes filled with waterproof notebooks. And yeah, we used to give every cook a waterproof notebook. Should have thought about that. And a waterproof <laughs> pen when they started so that they could write all the recipes down. And if it were to get wet, obviously that would be okay. And every now and then it would be fun to walk by and grab a cook's notebook out of their pocket and throw in a pot of water <laughs> and watch their expression because they had used a pencil. But, <laughs> but it would be like going back to a notebook and saying, oh, uh, okay, let's, let's like, we're taking notes and you're just constantly having ideas. And now I do it on my phone versus on a notebook. And you go back and you just look at an idea. And somewhere I came across the idea of deep fried hollandaise. And because it had been a couple of years since we had done deep fried mayonnaise, we'd learned a bunch of things. And so we decided to try deep frying mayonnaise. But during that process, we didn't really think about what to do once we figured out the dish. Yeah. Okay. So it's live. It's on the menu. Is there a process of like customer feedback that you're getting to then tweak it further? Or is it by that point, is it just done? Um, it's not so much customer feedback for tweaking it because by then we've tasted a lot and we believe that it tastes good, you know, and we we're pretty comfortable with the way it tastes and we think it's good. But what happens is a lot of the tweaking comes from the cooks because cooks are great observers, great observers, because they're doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. And they're noticing their thinking because they've been empowered to like, they're seeing that maybe the hollandaise is blowing out in the fryer and so they're starting to think i don't like getting yelled at for the hollandaise blowing out so i'm going to solve this problem but what am i going to do and it, let's try breading it th three times instead of twice let's try freezing it let's try freezing it and then frying it and aha we froze it we fried from frozen we put it in the oven it stopped blowing out but that wasn't how it was conceived. It was cooks trying something over and over again, and not, I'm being cheeky saying that they're trying not to get in trouble. They're actually generally trying to make something better. And I think that that's how great kitchens work because whatever it is this cook is doing, they're doing it over and over and over again, every day, all night. And so they are inherently thinking of ways to do it quicker, faster, better, better results. And so they're coming to you. There's no right or wrong way to poach an egg, to do anything, right? But if you understand what's happening, the science, if you understand the variables, then you can begin to turn the knob to the left two clicks or to the right four clicks and try to get different outcomes, you know? And that's what I was trying to do, is trying to give people the knowledge, the understanding of what the clicks would do so that you go turn the clicks, you go and try it, and you come back to me and say, hey, you know, we cooked this egg for like two more minutes. I kind of like the way the texture is. Great. Let's try it. Let's see it. You know, but at some point it goes on the menu and some point, like most of that work is done. Most of that R and D is done. Yeah. And so then there's, it's a fine tune that goes on forever. 
Yeah. I think something really interesting for the group here, where obviously this is the Mies team, we have a recipe technology company, is when you think about creating food in a kitchen, it isn't just does it taste good, right? You have to actually be able to execute it every single day in the kitchen that you're in. And then maybe you have two kitchens then, right? And so the thing that you're cooking is, you know, the, the combi oven that you're using, is it a different water pressure, right? Is there more humidity in this side of the kitchen and you're making something and you need to adjust the recipe or all of that matters. And so a dish isn't just about like the right amount of salt, the right amount of sugar. It's what station is it coming off of? You know, who's going to execute this thing? What, you know, what does my kitchen allow me to do with this? And I think that's a really great lesson for us, you know, when we're thinking about like how we're helping chefs because, you know, there's, there's a lot more than just coming up with good food in a kitchen. There were techniques that were just too hard. They were too hard to execute. We had this one dish where we figured out if you took egg whites and you just blended them for a long time till they got, you know, egg whites are kind of like gross, right? They're kind of snotty and weird. And if you blend them for a while, they get loose, season them. You put them in an eyedropper and you set a pan, a very shallow frying pan on the stove, and you just started dropping the egg whites into the water. You get these little perfect circles of egg white which is cool, right? Because you could then scoop them out and you could have egg whites in the round. But if you just let them sit and you just kept doing it and doing it and doing it in the pan, it would make this thing that looked like the surface of the moon or FRP, you know, like pebbly mm-hmm. FRP, yep. which is not delicious. I don't think it's, <laughs> it's wall paneling. But it looked like the surface of the moon and then you picked it up and it was this egg white that was very tender but it had this crazy texture and you could roll things in it. We did this thing for a book where we, we took the egg yolk from the Eggs Benedict and we put it in the whites and we rolled it up and we cut it and it was this beautiful little hard boiled egg. It took me like three hours to make five. And no matter, I tried for days and days to figure out how to do it. And I was like, we just we can't do this. Now, maybe in a different world, maybe in an El Bulli or a Noma, they could, they could allocate three people to do that for five hours. But that was what was different for us. We were a small brigade compared to all these other places. You know, we were a small team. We were at our biggest, we were like 13, which is not a lot for a fine dining, you know, place doing all these wonky techniques that don't exist anywhere. And there was no thing I could buy that would make egg white sheets faster because they didn't exist. Yeah. I'm sure it's a common problem. It's also a parallel, I think, with cooking and technology is that some innovation is blocked by just viability and economics. Like we could build lots of other cool technologies, but like, you know, in how much time with how many developers and how much will it cost us and how much will people actually pay for it? It's the same thing in the kitchen. You know, you can come up with ideas 10, 10x more, you know, complicated and fun than that. But if you can't execute them every day, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, if you can't sell them. I mean, I, yeah. we, we were lucky enough at one time to work with a small, really crazy, smart, interesting group of Mars. Everyone knows M&M Mars, right? They, everyone knows what an M&M is. And this, this group of people was instrumental in introducing us to a lot of really, really cool stuff early on in the history of WD-50. It was someone my father met at a cocktail party that worked at Mars, and this weird connection was born where next thing you know, I'm driving in a car out to a part of New Jersey where M&M Mars has one of their factories, and I tell you, it's nuts. You get 10 miles away, and it's like all you smell is chocolate. It's like out of a movie, and you're like, okay, I'm definitely getting closer, you know? And you get there and there's a room full of, you know, little tiny cement mixers where they're making, you know, M&Ms in a million colors. And cement mixers? Cement mixers where they're, you know, they're, they're uh, yeah. panning, they're panning chocolates, right? And I was talking, you know, we developed this relationship and they were really instrumental in helping us with a lot of really cool stuff and understanding stuff. And I said to them once, I said, wouldn't it be neat if you could make a liquid center M&M? Because, right? Wouldn't you want an M&M that was liquid? Doesn't that sound delicious, right? They're like, oh yeah, we can do that. I was like, Oh, what the fuck are you waiting for? (laughs) They're like, oh, we already know that we can't sell X bajillion units of it. So it just sits over there and we can't. You're like, but ah, liquid center M&Ms? Your brain would melt if you had a liquid center M&M. Where's the boutique M&M store we can go to? But like to your point, right? There's more to it than just a great idea. A great idea has to have viability. You know, the egg white was a great idea that I couldn't actually do. The brilliant minds of M&M, Mars, could make liquid center M&Ms, but they knew it wouldn't be a big hit, so they put it on the shelf. 
Our CTO, Mary Lee, is glowing right now. Because she's <laughs> like, I told you. Did she uh, have the same idea for liquid center M&M's? Oh, well, she would, she would probably eat a thousand M&M's. She's a fanatic for chocolate, but also, you know, she has to build every idea that we have, so her and her team. Okay, well, I'm going to skip around a bit because talking about Mies, we, we recently released, finally, I've wanted to release this for since the day we launched the product, but, you know, I don't get what I want most times. We released a feature that allows you to calculate the percentage of ingredients, both the standard percent and the baker's percent, uh, which we can talk about what those are. So what took you so long? Uh, yeah, I got to ask, you know, <laughs> merely about that one. So I want to talk about why calculating the percent of ingredients is so important for cooking. And uh, we do have at least one baker in the audience. So maybe we could talk a little bit about why, well, your thoughts on baker's percent versus standard percent. Well, I think that I would say it goes without saying, but it doesn't because very few people, it would appear, are that curious about the percentages of the ingredients within relationship to each other. But more often than not, from my perspective, cooking includes a lot of functional ingredients. So things like flour, that they serve a function, right? So understanding how much of that ingredient is in there allows you to understand, again, if cooking is about turning the dial, moving the lever, whatever you want to, example you want to use, if you don't understand how much of that ingredient is in there, how can you understand how to turn the dial? I mean, there are cooks here and there are probably cooks everywhere that when you ask them, what's the basic amount of salt that you would put in a dish might actually say it's around 1%, generally 1%. That's a golden rule, right? For the amount of salt that you start baseline. 1% in something, right? It's not unilateral. You're looking at me like you want to disagree with me. You're welcome to disagree with me. I've, I've, I've admittedly created a forum that people are allowed to disagree with me. So disagree uh, no, let's, with let's me. Let's go with it, 1%. But okay. generally speaking, obviously it's not the same thing yeah, across yeah. the board. That's probably high for ice cream, uh -huh. right? But then they stop right there and they would just say, yeah, well, it's about 1%. But like, that's the most functional. That's like that's an important number, right? Oversalted food's a bummer. Undersalted food is a bigger bummer. You know, like so. Why not understand how they all the ingredients play together? You know, look. Not everybody has to use xanthan gum, right? Not not everybody has to use those kinds of functional ingredients. But I can't tell you how many times I've seen someone just put a pinch of xanthan gum in something. Mm. That's crazy. Okay, because that's not how that works. When something is used in tenths of a percent, you have no idea what you're doing. You have no, you can't control the outcome. Yeah. And again, for me, if you want to control the outcome, which is, I think, what cooking is, it's controlling the outcome. So if I don't know how the ingredients play to each other, how can I possibly intelligently play a part in controlling the outcome? Now, Baker's percent is weird. Baker's percent doesn't help you unless you're on a desert island and the only thing you have is a coconut shell and flour. Why would you base everything off the flour? Because it, it's a truly random way of conceiving a recipe. Unless you're talking about like pound cake, right? Which is a pound of butter, a pound of sugar, a pound of eggs, a pound of flour, right? And I'm sure you don't make your pound cake like that anymore, but that's how pound cake was invented, right? It's a pound of four things. You know, the French called it four pounds. Chef, sorry, for the group, standard percent and baker's percent, which most of you probably know, but standard percent is the percentage of the ingredients relative to all the ingredients right, in the recipe. So their total weight, the total weight of the thing. Yeah. And how much each ingredient weighs and what its percentage is in relation to the total weight. Baker's percent is when you base everything off the weight of the flour. Because it's the largest amount. Well, and to be fair, to help Ursula for one minute, we sometimes use baker's percent for charcuterie. So, for example, if we're making a sausage and we use you know, pork belly and pork shoulder, and then everything else is relative to the weight of that, so a quarter percent of nitrate relative to the total amount of meat. So there's that part of baker's percent as well. Um, also, silly. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> let's let's good do for, it, Jeff. Good, good for you. <laughs> Congratulations. You're not well, learning. <laughs> well, I mean, I think of meat, you know, like when I season a piece of meat and how much salt goes into that meat. But your that point is you a that meathead. 
among among other things. And your point is that, well, there's that salt in the meat, but then I add sugar to that meat or I add acid to that meat. And then that changes that percent. And that's why you're... you're sure, I'm opening a pizzeria and all everybody wants to talk about it is what is your hydration? So I like to say it's like 35% because then their brain goes out yeah. <laughs> in the side of their head because that doesn't make any sense. But why are we talking about the amount of water that's in your dough in relationship to the amount of flour? Both of those things are functional ingredients. So understanding how they relate to each other is important, but how they relate to each other is actually part of how they all relate to each other. And, and that might sound simple and it might sound petty. And it's not worth like more than a few minutes talking about it. It's not helping me learn how the ingredients are in relation to each other. So it's not helping me make good decisions yeah. about how to make it better. And that's all I want. I want all the information in a way that allows me to make it better. And yes, we can all work with Baker's Percent and make things better because you just use that as your baseline. And you're just saying, okay, well, if my hydration for my pizza dough is 64%, let me try 62 and let me try 66, let me try 68. And if I don't like the results, I can tweak it. But at the end of the day, it's a more effective, holistic approach to cooking if you understand the whole thing. I mostly like to poke at Baker's because- Who doesn't? <laughs> No, I, and and I and again, I don't I don't mean to be cruel because that's not the point. I, I do find it simply doesn't make sense. For instance, when people in General Mills, when all the food scientists are developing, you know, your Cheerios and stuff, they want the full percentages of the total weight because they want to understand how to fine tune the end result. And you can fine tune the end result with either thing. It just strikes me as odd that you wouldn't start with how much does the whole thing weigh and then back out the amount of each thing. That's yeah. All. So it's a big handicap to truly like iterating on a recipe and understanding what each ingredient does. But it's a big crutch if you just want to wrap your head around what goes into a bread or a Yeah, a I I just again, for me it's interesting. It's interesting to me to understand how, you know, like when I was making donut glaze and all of a sudden I'm like, "Wait a minute. 72% of a donut glaze is sugar." Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And I'm like railing against soda. Like I have no business doing that, you know? And that's, I should have gone to Baker's Percent because there's a lot less sugar. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so, and it makes us feel better, it sounds like. One thing I've learned is that at some point, don't buck the system, right? I hated for years molecular gastronomy. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense, right? Like if it's Friday night and you're going out for dinner, Honey, do you want to go out for Chinese or Thai or should we have molecular gastronomy? <laughs> Does that sound delicious? Are you ever going to pick molecular? You know, I'm really, I, like, I could go for some molecular gastronomy tonight. I've been thinking about it all day. No, I never. Am... Never once has that ever happened. Uh, we crave sodium alginate at so, least once a week. So I used to hate the term. I used to hate it. And I used to say that's awful. That's stupid. It's a field of actual scientific study, molecular gastronomy. So that does a disservice to the molecular gastronomist. The same way calling a molecular gastronomist a chef is a disservice. It's like, you know, you would never say, what do you do for a living? I'm a biologist. No, you're a chef. That's what you are. So I hated it. But at some point I was like, you're being silly, right? It's a term. It's working. People know what they're getting into now at this point. Okay. We call it modernist. We call it whatever you want. Now it's part of the vernacular. So just let it go. You know, that's what, hopefully that's what comes with being a little bit older and wiser and certainly more mature, is you let that go. And that's how I feel about Baker's Percent. Like, it, <laughs> I, it, it's cruel for me to sit up here and say, Baker's Percent is stupid. You know, it's more fun to do that with people that don't take it the wrong way, because I don't want you to feel bad, but I do want to poke fun at, at bakers that are too serious and take their sourdough the way they do, because you should get out and see some sun. <laughs> And we'll make sure King Arthur never hears this. <laughs> they probably use regular percentage. <laughs> okay, so moving on, let's let's actually just shift topics and, and talk a little bit about execution. Going back to who are we executing? I vote Kurt. <laughs> oh, oh, wait, we're gonna talk about Kurt a little bit too. <laughs> so I remember uh, the first time I met you uh, again. It was was it twenty years? No, almost twenty years ago, two thousand three. You were making a dish with baby romaine. It was braised baby romaine, I believe. And you brought a case out on the line. You were working hot apps. And you must have gone through 19 pieces of baby romaine before you picked the one that you were going to use to cook. And I just remember like thinking, like, I don't, why is that one not that one? And, and not that one too? 
you have incredibly high standards. And obviously it's difficult to promulgate that to an entire like team all day, every day. So how do you inject those standards into your team when you're not on the line? How do you make sure that your team that's working with you has those same standards when you're not there? And yes, I know you work like every day. So you know maybe that's not an excuse. I think that that is about creating an environment where people feel invested in the outcome. You know, again, it's a team sport. The idea is that we all win and we all win if the people have a good experience that come to the restaurant. And, and, and it's creating an environment where people feel invested in the process. And I, and I think there's a lot of steps along the way to making people feel valuable. And that's, you know, how you treat them. That's the environment you create. And by that, I mean things like how staff meal, we, take, we make a good staff meal you know, being democratic about the music that we listen to, that everybody gets to play their music, no matter how bad it is. You know, I don't play my music. I don't drive people crazy with the music I like to listen to. But like, it, it's a- it, Norwegian you know, death metal, is that? <laughs> that's stupid. <laughs> um, but, you know, I don't think that you can undervalue creating a culture, creating an environment. And creating that culture is what gets people to care. You know, like I remember stories of, people working for Robichon, Joel Robichon, who is one of you know, the greatest chefs ever, but he's also one of the most brutal chefs ever and was notorious for making the garbage bags clear in his restaurant so he could see what people were throwing out. And that seems like the wrong approach, right? That seems like you don't trust your staff. That seems like you're obviously looking for trouble. You know, managing through fear, like that doesn't seem great to me. And I think, again, there's all these steps along the way to create an environment where people can feel valued and respected. And, and it's just the environment. Yes, I, I was an M far you know, from perfect. And we have these moments where, you know, that I, that I wish I could take back. But, you know, I think running around the block is good for esprit de corps. I mean, you know, that's a story where, you know, Kurt and I, I don't even remember, to be honest, how the dare of racing around the block came about. I was talking shit, shit. <laughs> so, so Kurt said he could beat me in a foot race around the block. And, you know, it started out well for Kurt. <laughs> but I had a better understanding of the lay of the land. And as we went around one of the blocks, there was an alley. And Kurt foolishly turned into the alley, not recognizing that blocks are longer than that. <laughs> which allowed me to pass him. But ultimately, through sheer grit and determination, he beat me. But like those moments when the whole staff is out on the street having a chuckle and the chef loses and everybody's happy, like that's team building in the best possible way. You know, that's good for everybody. That was fun to i mean to the best of my knowledge i don't think it left any deep scars no, no. on kurt and you know but that's about creating a, a place where all that can happen and you know creating an environment where it's okay to talk shit to the chef like that I, to me is that's how you get people to care about what they're putting on the plate when you're not there is you build an environment where everybody feels like if this thing succeeds i'm going to be a part of making it succeed and that feels good that I was part of making this place succeed. I'm not just some thing that's stuck in the corner making noodles out of shrimp. I'm part of something bigger and better. And I feel good when I see what this is. And I, and I, I feel, you know, when I look back at the story of WD-50, like we set out and we achieved most of the goals that, that I had aspired towards. And so I feel good about the arc of the restaurant and People ask me, what do you miss the most? And I miss the people. I miss the people that we did it with. You know, every year on New Year's Eve, every year, it's the longest day of the year. If you're a cook, you know it's the longest day of the year. You work forever. But then we would go out for like five or six hours together. After spending 16 hours working together, we would then go out and do more stuff. And, you know, you spend a 24 hours with people and, you know, there's, oh, I spend more time with you than with my real family. But there's truth to that. And so if you do it in a way that is respectful of everybody and you can have fun, and you know, again, I have to be careful because I keep repeating myself as I do my dotty old age, but it's about creating a culture. It's about creating a place where people feel 
valued. And so when they feel valued, they will do the right thing when they're not being watched. That's pretty simple in a way. Yeah. I mean, I think some of the top down there, at least for me, from getting to know you more is just as accomplished as you are and as, as serious as you are about cooking, you're one of the most humble people I've ever, I've ever met. And I think that resonates with cooks. And as Kurt can attest, I'm kind of slow. Slow is another one. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you had, I think there's, there's a saying in, in the culinary world that, you know, one of the best signs of a great chef is the chefs that came after him through his kitchen. And there's just so many chefs that were part of your kitchen. And I'm curious, you know, you clearly create this environment of fun and openness and transparency and meritocracy, but how much of that is also picking the right people versus the culture that you're creating? I mean, you can try your best to pick the right people, but I think in a kitchen, when you hire somebody, you don't spend a ton of time with those people before you take a chance on them. You know, you might come for a day or two, and then you say, okay, I think this person is going to be right for us. There might be times in the arc of a restaurant where you don't have a lot of choice and you're, you, need, you need people. Someone's leaving, you know, multiple people leaving. You know, I never like to sing, oh, I'll take a warm body. I never like that because that doesn't feel right. But there are times when you're kind of like, this is a person I have. I'm going to take this person. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's not about like making sure that it's a great fit. It's about making them like the fit. You know, I mean, you have to like them, but I think if, over time, people can say, wow, I kind of like what's going on here. I want to be on board with what's going on here. Yeah, I love that. Thanks for tuning into the Mies Podcast. The music from the show is a remix of the song Art Mirror by an old friend, hip-hop artist, Fresh Daily. For show notes and more, visit getmies.com forward slash podcast. That's G-E-T-M-E-Z dot com forward slash podcast. If you enjoyed the show, I'd love it if you can share it with your fellow entrepreneurs and culinary pros and give us a five-star rating wherever you listen to your podcasts. Keep innovating. Don't settle. Make today a little better than yesterday. And remember, it's impossible for us to learn what we think we already know. See you next time.